Simon Kenda spearheads KCKW LLP's transitional practice advising businesses locally, nationally, and internationally. Simon advises clients in industries as diverse as software, healthcare, manufacturing, real estate, finance, F&B, retail, and nonprofit. Simon has enjoyed successful stints in Malaysia, India, Dubai, and Saudi Arabia, where he was an integral part in handling transactions valued at over $400 million, as well as multi-jurisdictional corporate structuring. Simon has put on these seminars before. He had his webinar that he provided us, and we sent it out to the uh, team that we have all of our contacts. And today, what he's going to do is a brief overview of that seminar, of the webinar, and then he'll answer questions. Again, if you do have questions that you'd like answered, please go ahead into the chat box like Stephanie explained, and we can go ahead and take care of those. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Simon Kinda. Simon, thank you. Thank you so much, Bobby, for the kind introduction and, and to, the, to the rest of the chamber team for, for putting this on and allowing us to hopefully help help the members. As you can tell from the acting, and as Bobby said, I am, I'm from the UK, but I've, I've spent about nine years, years now here in the US. So um, as indicated by Bobby, the intention really for today was to give a very brief overview of the two programs that have already been rolled out since April the 3rd, um, but give participants an opportunity to really ask questions in the event they've already submitted applications and have questions about the process moving forward, if they've received loans, um, and also uh, forgiveness questions. Or if you've not submitted an application, then we, we'll cover some questions related to that as well. So for the most part, I believe the Q&A is going to be centered around these two loan programs. Uh, beyond that, if we have some time, we may very well touch on wider issues that are affecting people in the real estate industry, landlords and tenants, as well as uh, businesses with respect to contractual obligations. There's been a lot of discussion about that and how this COVID-19 pandemic has really shifted the landscape point uh, in case us all participating through Zoom webinars and conferences rather than the uh, in-person meetings. So with that, I'm going to share my screen to go over just a couple of slides and then uh, I'll probably turn over to, to you, Stephanie, to ask some of the questions that will pop up on the chat and, and we'll, we'll go from there and, and hopefully everyone will have a fruitful experience and, and get information that they need. So with that being said, I will get the presentation going and you will not need to have a look at me anymore for a little while. <laughs> so bear with me. So as I mentioned, we'll be talking about the loan programs. I'm a partner at Kandani Chan Kinder Wilson, uh, or KCKW, and I handle our transactional practice, business and real estate. Um, we'll start with the EIDL. So that's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Uh, both of the programs, the EIDL or EDL and the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP are both SBA loan programs, as many of you will know now. It's, it's in the news all the time. Uh, they have different purposes, different criteria in terms of what is available to a potential borrower, but they are both SBA programs. Now, the EDL program is a little different. The EDL program is something that has been around for many years already under the SBA. Um, it's a program that was geared towards helping local communities specifically with um, those suffering from economic injury as a result of a natural disaster. So typically um, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, fires, these sorts of things, which you know, thankfully are, are not too common. But in light of COVID-19 and what it's really done as a national and global issue, um, that program has been expanded. So how is that working? For those who wanted to apply for this program, you would have applied directly through the SBA website and you should have submitted that. That program had been available before the 
uh, CARES Act was even rolled out and, and was available before the PPP program was available. But it's a true loan. A, loan, a borrower could apply as long as you fell within the SBA criteria of a small business, essentially, then you could apply for the loan up to a maximum of $2 million. So previously, it used to be a $1 million cap, and that was increased to $2 million. It was a loan at 3.75% interest with a reduction for non-profit, so 2.75%. Repayments on the loan would be deferred from 6 to 12 months um, on that. So there was also that break that was provided as part of the CARES Act to ensure people had an opportunity to focus on using the money whilst they got their business back on uh, back up and running. And it could be used for, the loan can be used for a broad array of costs. So it's really targeted to helping people with their business operational needs, including rent, mortgages, salaries, and so on. So much broader use of the money than what the PPP program was designed for, which was really for, for paycheck protection. Because it was a loan and is a loan, if an individual or a business took a loan out in excess of $200,000, then personal guarantees were required to be given and will be required to be given. Equally, if the loan is more than $25,000, then for that, collateral would need to be pledged as well. So the SBA would require some sort of security over your assets. You'll see here I've got this thing called the EDEL Advance. This has changed. Uh, this was first touted as a $10,000 grant that the government would give to anyone who applied for this. So most people or anyone in fact who made the application and submitted it online would have seen at the end of that very short application online application there was a checkbox that you could select to request a ten thousand dollar grant now we have to understand that the stimulus package was at around 350 360 billion dollars of which 349 billion was dedicated to the ppp program and only 11 billion dollars was allocated for this EDL program, which is a very small amount of money um, in the grand scheme of things. And what that meant is SBA and the Treasury had to amend their rules to say it wouldn't be a $10,000 grant anymore, but they would base this off of your number of employees. So that's why the advance had been reduced to $1,000 per employee. That's an important change, an expectation. Uh, that people need to have. Uh, a couple of facts, um, three, just over $3 billion of those advances, those 10,000 or up to $10,000 advances have already been made. And a total of about $5.5 billion of loans have already been made by the SBA as it relates to the EDL program. Um, that is important to know for two things. We can already see that the money has been allocated and distributed. A lot of people have said, I've submitted my application and I've not received any money. It is coming. It's just taking a lot longer than was anticipated because SBA has processed more loan applications in the last two weeks than they would normally do. I think they said something along the lines of in 14 years based on their average because so the system has been completely overwhelmed by this. But the other thing to note is if you have not already applied for the EDL program, unfortunately at this time, until further stimulus is released, um, and we're not certain it will be released, allocated any at all to the EDL program, one can no longer apply for it. So if you've not applied, unfortunately, you'll already be too late. So that's the EDL program. The PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program, is the much larger one which was $350 billion allocated to that, uh, which is really designed to, as the title says, keep people employed. So help people stay off unemployment, keep their jobs, continue to get paid, and encourage businesses to do so during this very difficult time. Very different to the EDL program. Um, this 
whilst it is touted as somewhat of a loan, it's a short term loan because it's only a maximum two year loan. You can see the interest rate is at is capped at one percent. The maximum amount that a person can apply for or could have applied for on the loan was two and a half times their average annual uh, monthly payroll uh, based off of a 12 month period, a 12 month average. So up to $10 million maximum. This application was not made directly with the SBA. In order to make this application, you had to apply directly through a lender or a credit union, a small bank. So they're an approved list of lenders, but you had to apply directly with one of those. There was, again, repayment on this would be deferred by six months, but it'd be a max two year term loan. But you'll note also that the proceeds are much more narrowly used for the PPP. So if you've already received the money or if you are going to receive the money, you can use the money for payroll, healthcare benefits, commissions, and the list is there for, for that period of time. Um, but there's no guarantee or no collateral. So this was a hugely um, anticipated and uh, a great program for businesses to really take advantage of uh, because there's no guarantees or collateral. And the beauty of this is that whilst it is in essence a loan, potentially the full amount of your loan could be forgiven as long as from for an eight week period from the moment you receive the loan if during that eight week period you use 75 percent of the loan towards your payroll costs which were very clearly defined what payroll costs would be and then the other 25 percent could be for permitted uses which are rent utilities or mortgage interest four contracts that had to be in effect before february 15th of this year so it couldn't be new new obligations they have to have been related to contracts that had already been enforced prior to February. So if you receive the loan, or if you are anticipating receiving the loan, and you use it for these periods and, and these purposes, my apologies, then you stand to have the entire amount forgiven um, and not pay anything. But it is also important to know, as a final point before we turn over to some questions, is that the forgiveness portion of this could be reduced depending on if your your employee count is reduced or your full-time employee count for that matter or if there is a reduction in salary to employees and it's got to be a reduction of 20 more than 25 percent then you could see your forgiveness portion being reduced so in short what you could find yourself in as a situation and i'll skip this slide for a moment but what you could find yourself in a situation, as you see here, is in my hypothetical, a person could have borrowed and been entitled to borrow about $200,000. They may have spent $160,000 for their permitted uses, but then what their forgiveness amount could have been reduced because they reduced payroll, they reduced their employee count. And so how the forgiveness is going to work is going to be very important and how you track that is going to be extremely important as well so that's just a brief overview of those it's also important to note a couple of things that a person was and still is eligible to apply for both of these programs so you didn't have to pick between one or the other um, that's that's important to know and even though Early in the week, or I should say last week, SBA announced that they had used all of the money. All of the money had been allocated already. It's important to know, as you would have seen in the news this morning and yesterday, the Senate recently passed a second and what they expect to be the final amount of money, uh, which the House will hopefully approve, um, to add an extra uh, few hundred billion to the uh, PPP program. So if you have been waiting and you, you think it's too late, I would encourage you get your applications ready and continue because there is another wave of money that we expect to come. But note it is also going to, as we understand, the, be the final amount as well. So I'll turn over, I think, to some questions 
for now um, and then we can we can go from there in terms of any other uh, issues we want to discuss uh, in this presentation so Stephanie I'll hand over to you. Thank you Simon. First question can you use 100% of the PPP for payroll and have it be forgiven? Yes absolutely so um, that's important to know the threshold is simply that a minimum of 75 percent needs to be used for payroll as far as ESPN and the government is concerned this is program was geared towards protecting employees and keeping them employed so if you use 100 percent towards payroll then all the better absolutely you could Wonderful. Okay, the next question we have is, how do we report the expenditures to make sure we get the forgiveness on the PPP? Right, this is, really, uh, this is a really good question, and I'm actually going to skip to a slide um, on, on that so that people can um, see how this would work. One thing I would strongly suggest is if you receive the money or, or are to receive the money, First and foremost, it would be very prudent for you to ask your lender if you can open a separate sub account with your existing business account that you have with them so that the money can be parked in there and it'd be very easy to track everything because you'll then start to write your payroll checks for that eight week period, your payments for your rent, your payments for your utility payments. You will write those from that sub account. It's not fatal if you don't, but it'll make it much easier for you to track how you, you've um, used that money and for the bank to then use that as part of the reconciliation process. So if you do it just by virtue of running a spreadsheet um, and, and running the deductions based on where, what you had or just rely off of the, the bank statements, um, documentation is going to be very important here. And it's also important to know, um, as it relates to that question, that the day you receive the money, the eight week period starts then. So it's not that you can receive the money and wait until you know, your business can formally open the shelter in place orders lifted and then use the money down the line to bring back your employees. The eight week timeline is going to start from the day you receive the money. Uh, so I hope that answers the question, but feel free to respond in the chat if, if you want further clarification on that question. Great. Um, I have another question here. If the money is used for healthcare benefits, is that considered a part of payroll? Yes. So payroll costs were, were quite clearly defined as to what they would encompass. And so from the perspective of payroll, you will see that it does cover healthcare benefits and payments related towards those or contributions towards those. Again, you would want to check with your bank. Um, I think this has been one of the very difficult things for people to know. There is still not as yet clear guidance on what the forgiveness will look like. Even banks don't have it. So whilst they have some, some idea of how the forgiveness is supposed to work based on payroll costs, which were clearly defined, which included um, healthcare benefits, we will still have to see. So SBA has been monitoring this. The SBA has been updating and releasing guidance. Right now, most of the guidance they've been issuing has been to clarify how one applies for the loan, who's eligible for the loan, dealing with application issues and certification issues and so on. I expect it would still probably be a few more weeks before we get very clear guidance on how banks are supposed to treat and deal with forgiveness. So for now, I'd say, you know, abundance of caution, track everything, save your documentation. That's why I recommend you try to park it in a separate account if, you're, if possible, and then make the payments from there. But healthcare could certainly um, do that and be covered. Yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty scary to think that they'll give it to you, but they don't know exactly what they're going to do at the, <laughs> yeah. the end of it. Okay, I have one more question at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. If an employee declines to return, how will that affect the loan forgiveness and the PPP? Yeah, th th this is really important because unfortunately a lot of businesses, and we've spoken to a number of our clients, um, 
and those clients have laid in, unfortunately had to lay people off and then they want to hire people rehire those people um, there's a twofold thing here if the person refuses to come back to work then that employee is obviously going to have difficulty being able to get their unemployment insurance benefits right so you would expect an employee would rather get paid even if they're still sitting at home their full salary for the eight week period then refuse to come back to work but naturally maybe they're, they're hesitant because of the the climate and the scare you know um, being fearful of, of contracting the virus and so unfortunately if they don't come back then you're going to be a little stuck because you wouldn't have spent the money at the same time it doesn't mean to say that you couldn't hire new or replacement people for people that have already left right so again that's why it's so important when i show that calculation how much you receive versus how much you spend or get to spend and how much gets forgiven could be three totally different amounts the expectation just to round off that question the expectation is that it is likely many people will decide well if i've still got now a balance here which is going to be a loan albeit at one percent maybe they don't want that cost of capital and so they may just repay the loan back the balance back to the bank and that's important to know because with both the either and the ppp program there is no prepayment penalty for giving the money back right so so that's how that would work stephanie great we had another one come in as well this one's a little bit long so i'm going to read it kind of slow okay yeah so if you are self-employed and the only employee in that company even though there is no payroll the annual distribution would be the pay divided by 12 times 2.5 months can be given paid to self-employed person and total funds in and then paid out and it should be forgiven great question and here we have a slide for you to answer that for you um the way that would work is and, and this was really quite confusing so i'm going to add some further information with respect to this answer if you're self-employed and you don't have employees this is how your calculation would work so you would need to look at your 2019 irs form 1040 the schedule c you would look at line 31 that will indicate what your net profit amount is so you would use that number but it is going to be capped at a hundred thousand dollars so if your net income exceeds a hundred thousand dollars then you would have to reduce it back to a hundred thousand dollars so in in the sample example i've got here on the on the screen hopefully you can still see that here we use an example where the self-employed person has a net income um, of $130,000, that's step one. We reduce it by 30,000 to get them to the limit of 100,000 as required. That leaves you with $100,000 on an annual basis. You will divide that by 12, it gives you about $8,300 in change. Multiply it by two and a half, that's the maximum loan amount you would get. So you need to look at your, 20, your filed 2019 IRS Form 1040 Schedule C. Now, two things to note here. If you have not filed, as many people have not, if you've not filed this form, SBA has said you must still fill in this form and submit this form, even though it is not filed as, as a tax, you must submit it to show them how you arrived at your computation. So this will form part of the supporting documents you need to provide, even if you're not filed. So you'd fill this form in anyway. To add to this answer, for people who are self-employed and also happen to have employees, then what you would do is you would look at that, you would take my step one again, but you would also uh, look at your gross wages and tips on that same 2019 IRS form, but now this is your form 941. So you would take your 1040 form for your own net income. You would then add in any employees, if you have them, 
but you're a self-employed person, but have some employees, again, not independent contractors, have employees, and you'd add those in, and so those could also be uh, eligible for it. So hopefully that answers your question uh, with respect to how a self-employed person works. And yes, uh, sorry, your, your second part of the question was, could it be forgiven? Again, what they will look at is during the eight week period, they'll want to see what your net income was during that eight week period. And then that's the amount that will get forgiven. So. Okay. Um, oh, I, thought... I think they, there's a follow up question. I think yes. just popped up, Stephanie, about step five on the slide. Yes. Yes, so, sorry to cut you off. I'm seeing the chat as well, so uh, trying to help uh, answer those. Perfect. Step five on this slide. So far, I talked about receiving the loan, how you calculate the loan based solely on your payroll cost. If you had prior also received an EDL loan, if you'd received an EDL loan um, during the period of January 1st of this year to April 3rd of this year, then that EDL loan amount will it'll kind of get refinanced and added back into your PPP loan. So what step five is showing that imagine someone received an EDL loan of $15,000, but they then also got a, that advance, which I talked about being forgiven it would be really being a grant well that grant amount let's call it ten thousand dollars would be deducted from the forgiveness amount so that's why your ppp loan could increase if in the event you also happen to have re received an edel loan that's what step five is got it okay those are all the questions so far received if you want to go on to the next <clears throat> yeah Great. So beyond the loan program, I thought it was important for us to cover um, just a couple of brief points and we won't spend too, too much time on it. But, you know, many people um, that are part of the chamber or the, the wider community generally, they could be landlords, they could be tenants, um, many business owners, of course, small, medium and large business owners. And we have been receiving a lot of inquiries from people who are concerned about do I need to pay rent will I get evicted um, can I force my tenant to pay rent can I evict a tenant um, how does that work uh, what is this talk of this uh, fancy phrase called force majeure and and is that going to be a reason for me to maybe get out of a lease because you know many tenants if this has been so difficult for them that it's got to a point where they're not certain that their business is going to make it afterwards. And that's an unfortunate reality. So people are looking for ways and hearing talk of force majeure or impossibility and so on, and using this as hopefully a way to get out of their lease. The same is true for people that are buying and selling property. Many people are, have, are right now in the middle of buying a property or selling a property and people are scrambling because they uh, are not certain if they're going to be able to close or they would rather not close on their real estate deals. Um, the same is true for business owners. They've got contracts with vendors. They've got contracts with suppliers. They've got contracts with customers. People are not paying. And they're trying to figure out what does this all mean because of COVID-19. So very very briefly, um, force majeure and what it really means, it's to do with acts of God. So this has often been just very standard boilerplate language for people who haven't paid much attention to it. And acts of God have typically been earthquakes, hurricanes, tornado, these sorts of things. They've not often been broadly construed um, to say, deal with government orders and government regulations, as we've seen a lot of those being passed by counties and cities and states recently, or they've not necessarily covered health pandemics, right? And so when, if you're in a lease, either as a landlord or as a tenant, 
or for that matter, in a purchase ar uh, arrangement, your first is very fact specific, which is to say you're going to have to first see if the provision is even in there, then what are the contents of the provision, and then you also need to understand this. Force majeure, even though people are hoping to hang their hat on this as a way to maybe get out of a contract, so not just in leases, but in purchases or in business contracts, it's important to know that the clause is not intended really for termination. It is usually just to delay someone's performance in a contract. So maybe the supplier can't send you your product because of shipping issues and distribution issues. So it's intended to allow everyone to put things on pause until the event is over. And of course, we hope that God willing that COVID-19 and, and what, happening and how it's affecting so many people that it will um, pass sooner rather than later we can get to a sense of normality but force majeure is intended to allow people to freeze their obligations not completely evade them but it's very very specific and it requires a review of the lease or the purchase agreement or contract what we're seeing from a landlord's perspective um, is encouraging them to really work something out with their tenant this is a time when community is so important right we all understand that community is so important um, and to help people get through this and survive and so as landlords we really try to encourage them to find a way to maybe add on a few months to a person's lease give them a period of time and there are orders where whether it be residential or commercial leases um, to allow people to not pay right now and then pay it back over a specified period of time. So often you will see that's how this is going to work as opposed to being able to get out of a lease. The same is true in purchase and sale agreements for real estate. Um, we're seeing that people's situations have changed, but this doesn't necessarily mean under force majeure that a person is going to be able to break the sale of their property or the purchase of a property. Um, it's more going to be dealing with, okay, there may be delays that we need to prepare for. And so the California Association of Realtors has developed already a number of COVID-19 forms for realtors to use um, to help people through this process. Now, if there is no force majeure, then what we're going to see is um, people relying on, well, it's impossible for me to perform on my contract or this is my purpose has been frustrated. So there are always common law remedies. So without getting too much in the weeds, this is more information to say that when you have a contract, either as a business owner as a landlord, as a tenant, which applies to many of our, our listeners and so on, then it will be, this is useful information for you to know and to understand about what your rights are, equally what your obligations are, how to manage those two, and how it's going to be a very collaborative process to not run away from what we we're required to do, but to how to help each other, both sides of that equation, to get through this time. I think, you know, the chamber is so important as a resource to um, help businesses, local businesses um, under, and individuals understand how to navigate this. And they're a great resource for anyone. They've got access to accountants, CPAs, to marketing folks, restaurants and businesses that need support. So helping each other understand this information is, is really very uh, important and fundamental to, to get through this as smoothly and unscathed as possible. Taking advantage of government loan programs, but also knowing how contracts will work. So that's something I wanted to touch on with respect to real estate and businesses. Um, another part I think it's worth doing, Stephanie, I don't think we have any more questions right now. Is that correct? Correct. 
Yeah, I think another thing I will just highlight now, um, beyond beyond the existing loan loan programs, which has been quite a frustrating uh, issue for many people, there are other benefits within the CARES Act for people. So I've put a few of those here. There are the uh, payments, the checks that people are hoping to receive, depending on your annual gross income. You know, the government has promised and people are uh, getting these checks. The up to $1,200 per individual, $2,400 for a married couple, plus $500 for a child. So, you know, for a family of four, you could be looking at a decent amount of money, about $3,300 or so that you could be getting. So here I would encourage you, if you have not done already, go to the IRS website and update your information so that the IRS can directly deposit the money into your account and they have a tool to track these checks. It's a very helpful tool. You put in your basic information and you can track the status of that additional payment you may get. There are other provisions within the CARES Act for businesses to potentially defer their payroll taxes. Um, there are other provisions under the uh, employee benefits and employment benefits uh, related to pay, family leave, sick leave, unemployment insurance, and so on. Um, so a lot of other advantages that can be taken, uh, you know, sorry, that someone could, a number of programs that individuals could take advantage of to help them through this. You know, it'd be important to know because you, they want to avoid double dipping. You can't take a pay or tax credit and then at the same time take advantage of a PPP loan or certain provisions of a PPP loan. So it'd be important to know how to use these, but don't despair if you've not been able to take advantage of the PPP or the EDL because there are other programs within the CARES Act that also provide for that. So, um, yeah, just a few, few additional tidbits there of information that we hope you find uh, and, 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 and have found useful uh, for us. You know, feel free to reach out to the Chamber with questions. Feel free to reach out to uh, us if we have questions. We're more than happy to help. No obligation, of course. Um, I think we have another question, so why don't we... Why, why don't we take that one? Okay. Um, does a dependent adult college student who has not filed taxes on their own receive payments from the IRS? And do the parents who claim to the child get any reimbursement? Ah, right. This one, you, I, I will say you'll need to check specifically uh, with your CPA, but I believe that the benefit can also be had for the for the dependent as well but i would say again check that with your cpa it's much more tax related question so uh, so i can't complete that answer and lastly there's a question on when the stimulus payments will be made um, for individuals right um there is a lot of backlog lots of people have been receiving their their stimulus payments already and have been having their loans funded. Um, but I would still, from the time you submit your application, the PPP application, for example, you'll need to give it a, a couple of weeks before you'll, you'll hear anything. Um, the same is true for the EDA loan and those stimulus payments. Though a lot have been funded, they are still taking several weeks. As I, as I mentioned, the SBA has had to deal with um, funding essentially 14 years worth of applications and processing those in, in a much shorter period of time. So just be mindful of, of that and, and, be, and be patient with that. But I think for now, that should be the questions that um, people have had, correct? That's correct. I'll stop the screen share there. So we're back to video. Uh, Bobby and, and Stephanie, I don't know if if you have any uh, other questions or points you'd like, like me to discuss, but I, I certainly hope I'm obviously mindful of the time, but I hope this has been fruitful. You, you've done an awesome job, Simon, and I'm going to definitely want to schedule another time for you to come back uh, on a regular basis. 
I would like to just ask if people have not filed their taxes for 2019, was that already covered? Yes. So the way the way it, it was not covered specifically, banks are using different metrics. So one is using the metric of your average of your 2019 payroll. So that can just be pulled from your accountant, your books and records, not necessarily from your taxes, right? But a bank, as part of that, if you've had payroll, is at least going to file the form 940, 941 for the quarterly payroll taxes. Yes. So you will need to at least submit that as part of the evidence, even if you have not filed your 2019 tax. Equally, if you didn't rely on the 2019 average, you could also just look at the last 12 months prior to the application. So that would obviously straddle 2019 and 20. So, so thank you for the clarification. So if um, a company is on a leased employee program, where mm. they, are you familiar with the, that terminology? Yeah, somewhat, yeah. Okay. So they have their payroll costs, but then they also have their costs of doing business with the agency that they, they're doing it with. Do they get, do they can? Do they bundle everything together or is it just the payroll for the employees? Right. So this, this is a bit of an interesting one because the, where you've got like this least employee, so and SBA recognizes that you're using this third party company, that right. third party company actually will run a report for you, which is geared specifically towards the PPP program. So they've awesome. already got their calculations of what will and will not be covered for you. Okay. Right? And then what about for any um, temporary help that you, you've hired through an employment agency? So where someone has uh, been considered temporary employment and therefore their issue potential, the agency, there's a 1099 issue here? No, it, it wouldn't be a 1099. Right. You would... So a temporary, then temporary would still, yes, absolutely. Okay. And so yeah. that would still count and, and okay, perfect. Because we do have a lot of people that are in the placement business for, for employees. And we want to make sure that those clients that they've, that they're servicing will, will get a chance to, to get some reimbursement too. So yeah, Excellent. as long as they, well, they, they've covered them as, as employees, essentially. Yeah. Sure. Go on, Stephanie. Stephanie. Who can claim those employees, though? Is it the employment agency that issues their paychecks, or is it the company that they are working for temporarily? Right. So, again, it goes back to how the payment structure is worked on, on each person's accounting of how the company that's using the temp agency is uh, paying, paying them. Because okay. if... Right. So that's why I said it's a work looks at the treatment of the person as the employee or not. Right. And therefore, whether the employment agency gets to, to take the benefit or the company, it really should be the company because the employee agency is not paying them out of their own pocket. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a the pass through company. It's a pass through. The company is ultimately paying. So right. and they're just so, doing a surcharge for the convenience Excellent. of the program they offer. That's why. Again, and again, you have stretched my brain on this, and, and I so appreciate it because this is uh, uncertain times and new, new laws being developed every single day. And I appreciate someone with your intellect and your wisdom to be able to come through and, and simplify the process and make it to where it's not so daunting to us. So um, is there any other questions, Stephanie, that popped into the chat? No. No, great. And I think just to round it off as a last point from me, um, after this presentation, I believe the this will be distributed so people will have access to the material after the fact. And you know, if you have any questions, please direct them to the to the chamber. Uh, you're certainly welcome to direct them to us as well. But I would really look to the fantastic benefits that the chamber offers in terms of connecting its members. It's the it's the great advantage of of being a a member of the, the a chamber of commerce is is the work they do so despite having to work from home and all the rest of it i should be thanking you bobby and your team and stephanie for putting this together and and kind of really re-emphasizing what community means during this time well, we appreciate your kind words uh, on behalf of the corona chamber the board of directors and the 800 members 
representing over 45,000 jobs. Simon, thank you so very much for what you do for us and what uh, you do for so many people. Uh, we will go ahead and close out this meeting now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Take care.